There is nothing haphazard in the Bible. Every single book has been brilliantly designed. And when we understand the literary context of the books of the Bible and all that that entails, we can better understand whatever we are reading. A welcome to our final episode in our mini series, Lenses of Context. This is part six, literary, here we go. Lens of Context, part six, here we go. We have been doing this series in conjunction with this ebook, and most of you probably have your hands on it. If you don't, you can snag it in the details below this video. But we have been working through the six lenses of context, and the only one that we haven't tackled that we get to tackle in this episode is the literary one. And admittedly, there is a lot going on in the literary lens. In fact, what has been helpful for me over the years is to break down the literary lens into four parts. And so we're going to begin, first of all, with genre. And the idea here is that every single time we come to the biblical text, we need to ask ourselves the question, what kind of genre am I dealing with? Uh, because there are eight different genres in the Bible. Now, some people may classify it as seven different genres, some may even go to as far as 10, but these eight seem to make the most sense to me, and we actually describe them, give a description and connection uh, to another author that I borrow from and cite inside the ebook. But these are the eight different genres, and just like today, we don't read a legal document the same way we read a poem, the same way we read nonfiction, is the same idea when it comes to the biblical text, is that we want to understand what genre are we dealing with and what are the rules for that genre. Such as when it comes to history, dealing with stories like, you know, David and Goliath and Solomon and all these stories that are historical. Uh, poetry, Song of Songs, Law, Leviticus, Wisdom, looking at the wisdom literature like Proverbs. Now, here's, I'm just going to pause for a moment and give you a quick example of why it's important to understand what the rules are connected to that genre. Because Proverbs are not promises. Uh, I've had so many conversations with people who have been going through a difficult circumstance or they feel like that God has let them down in some way and they go, the problem is like I've been holding on to these promises of God and God isn't coming through or it just doesn't seem to be true. And I'm like, well, what passages are you holding on to? And in some cases they'll say something I'm thinking in my head, well, that's really taken out of context. And other times they quote me Proverbs and they go, you know, these are the promises of God. That's not what Proverbs are. Proverbs is part of the wisdom literature where the idea is, is that this is generally how life goes if you are living in accordance to God's ways. Now, that's not a guarantee. It's generally how life goes. And so when you engage with the Proverbs, that's important to understand. Uh, when you're dealing with prophecy, you're dealing with like Hosea and other prophets to understand, well, what is prophecy and what isn't prophecy? A parable, take your pick. Uh, you know, the letters of Paul, those epistles function differently than other aspects of the Bible. And then apocalyptic literature, you know, chief among those, Revelation. When you are engaging the book of Revelation, if you don't understand the nature of apocalyptic literature, you're going to struggle to understand facets of revelation where you go, well, is this literal or is this imagery driven? How is this all working out? Apocalyptic literature, understanding that is important when you're reading apocalyptic literature like revelation. So just knowing the genre, the rules associated with them will be helpful to you as you are engaging that particular passage or story from the Bible. Okay, the next piece is the design. What is the literary design of the book you are engaging with? And by far the most fantastic group that has helped people to understand that, we've been promoting them from day one, is Bible Project. Most of you are probably familiar with Bible Project. If not, 
go to BibleProject.com. They do a number of things. Uh, chief among them, the first thing that they really went after was to depict visually the literary design of every single book of the Bible. And they do this with an animated video. So they start with a clean slate, and by the end of the video, the whole thing has been animated. And then you can download as a PDF you know, each book of the Bible and what this picture is for its literary design. In fact, every single time that I'm reading my Bible, I have the Bible Project picture for that book next to me just to be reminded, oh yeah, this is the design of the book. Here are things to be looking for. So this is, you know, Exodus, uh, Jeremiah, you know, every book of the Bible has a different design. So every image looks drastically different, which is awesome. And they've got the best animators to help you to visually see what's going on. Uh, Matthew, this one is super helpful when you recognize that Matthew is the most Jewish of the four Gospels, and one of the primary things that Matthew is doing is helping his audience to see Jesus as the second Moses who has come to lead a new exodus. And so one of the quick observations that you draw out in understanding the literary design of Matthew is that there are five books of Moses, Genesis through Deuteronomy, and Matthew has five different teaching blocks of Jesus as one of many connections to how Jesus is a second like Moses figure. Uh, and this just helps you just at a glance go, oh yeah, that's right, I need to be looking for all the connections between Jesus and Moses in the Gospel of Matthew. And then you take again, like Revelation, super dense, there's a lot going on, but it's got a, a structure to it. And this visual helps you to understand that. Uh, one of the other things that Bible Project did a really fantastic job is just showing you how books of the Bible connect to one another. So when it comes to the Gospel of Luke, Luke wrote two books, Luke and Acts. Uh, and the problem is, is that in our New Testament, we've got John wedged between Luke and Acts, and there are reasons for that. But one of the things you see here is with the scroll of Luke, you kind of got a dot, 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 and then with Acts, you're getting that rest of the story. So Luke is writing Luke and Acts as one giant work, but it's got two volumes. And so one of the things that's helpful is to line Luke and Acts up together and see the continuity of what Luke is doing through his gospel and then the acts of the Holy Spirit through the disciples in the book of Acts. And so just one of the many ways that you can look at the literary design and draw additional meaning and understanding and it creates a framework for you to read that book of the Bible through. Okay, the next section is just what we call the W's. This is your very, you know, traditional who, where, when, why. Uh, the what is what you are studying. Uh, the W's is all the background, uh, the backdrop information. So, you know, who's writing this particular work, um, and where are they writing it from? That actually plays a critical role in what you are reading is not just the who, but the where. Like, where are they at in their journey of life? Where are they at from a location perspective? Um, when are they writing it? You know, and the circumstances around it. And then, of course, why are they writing it? You know, when it comes to Paul's letters, he is typically responding to problems. He's been to these cities, he's established a church there, he gets word that there are issues, and he's writing a letter in order to address those problems. And so when you can get a better understanding of, well, what are the problems, then you understand why he's writing what he's writing. Now, when you start to ask the question like, well, how do I figure out that information? A really great study Bible typically gives you this information right before you read that particular book of the Bible. So it's the intro to that book. And the two study Bibles that we recommend here at Walking the Text uh, are the Cultural Background Study Bible. You can get it in NIV, um, King James Version, or New King James Version. I can't remember which one. But you can also get it in the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version. Um, same study notes for all of them. The only thing different is the translation. But that and then the ESV Archaeological or Archaeology Study Bible, 
That is the other study Bible that we recommend here at Walking the Text. And both of these do a fantastic job of answering those questions in the intro to each book of the Bible. And so get your hands on these, consult those, and that will help you with that W's information. Uh, And then the last piece is placement. And that is just where is this passage or story placed within both its book, but also the entire Bible. And so we've got these different levels as well. And by the way, when when you usually talk to people and you ask them, you know, do you engage the Bible in context? It is usually just this placement piece that they are thinking that's what context means. And obviously, as you have engaged this lenses of context, you realize that it's much bigger than just where it is in relation to other parts of the Bible, but this is still a very significant piece that you want to engage in depth. And so you just begin with, here is the passage or story that you are engaging with. And then you just want to ask, like, where is this place in connection to what's surrounding it? So when the writers are writing, they are being very intentional about where they are placing things. And so when you're reading a story, look at the immediate surrounding of the stories that are around the passage that you are looking at and see, is there any connection? Is there any continuation? Uh, Does it help you to better understand your passage or story? And then it's not just in the surrounding parts of whatever book or letter you're dealing with, it's within that book itself. And so there's always a movement and you want to go, okay, if this story is taking place in this part of the book, then what is going on in the rest of the book that may help me to understand my particular story? And then you go another rung out to go within the author's work. So we gave the example of Luke and Acts. How is Luke using this word, not just in his gospel, but how is he also using it in the book of Acts? Is it there because obviously it's the same author who's writing these two works? Uh, Same thing with the apostle Paul. You know, 13 letters are attributed to him. How is he using, you know, these words or ideas or, you know, concepts throughout his various works? And then just within the scope of the Bible itself, what story am I dealing with? Where is it placed in the Bible as a whole? And this was why for me a number of years ago, Um, that I set out to do the restoration of all things. And if you've been following Walking the Text for any length of time, you're familiar with this teaching. It's on the entire Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Um, All the major movements, major characters, you know, nations that Israel was subjected to, just to get a better understanding of where are we. And this has probably been, for me, the most significant study that I ever did because what I used to do, and I would imagine for many of you as well, is that you know you come to a story in the Bible and you may look at the story in light of the larger book that you're dealing with, but if you don't know where this story is happening in the grand narrative, then you can struggle to go, well, why is God responding this way? Because in another story, God is responding that way. And the question becomes, where are we in the grand narrative? Because there is an overarching storyline and God may be doing something here, but he's doing something a little bit different here because we are on a trajectory. There has been movement, other events have occurred. And whenever we're looking at a story, we wanna place it in the larger narrative to go, what is going on in the movement of the entire Bible and how does my story connect in to the overarching story that's running from beginning to the end? And that will help you to better understand the story or passage that you are looking at. And so this is all part of that literary lens, the genre, the design, the W's and the placement And it may feel just, you know, a little bit overwhelming to go, well, that's a lot of questions 
to ask, but one of the things that you do is that the more that you're asking these questions and engaging this, the more you just naturally do that when you open up your Bible. You're already going to be asking all the questions that we have been asking, you know, in this episode. And in addition to that, some additional questions, you know, again, just what type of genre is this? That's one we did ask, but you just want to begin there. You know, what's its literary design? And are there any parallel stories? Meaning, does this story have echoes to other stories? Because because stories inform stories. And these are just a few of the basic questions to ask when you're getting into this literary lens, but engage them at all of the different levels that we have talked about, because now all of a sudden these connections start coming to you and you better understand what you are reading and what you're looking at. So friends, there you go. The six lenses of context to help us to read the text within its context to understand more fully what's going on in the Bible. And when you just kind of step back and if you've been following us for, you know, each of these six episodes, you go, and there is, again, a lot of questions to ask if you're looking at the Bible and a specific passage through all six lenses and what is encompassed in each of the six lenses. Exactly. Uh, It's exciting to be able to go, I've got all of these great questions to ask to help me to see things from different perspectives and really great resources to look at because the joy and the excitement comes when you see something that you haven't seen before. And so much can be unlocked with just one really good question. And all throughout the ebook, we provide questions associated with each of these. And if you've been engaging this mini series, you'll know that every episode has ended with here are questions you wanna ask in order to engage each of these lenses. And so as you journey ahead, for your journey, ahead. Our prayer and our hope and our desire is that this series has empowered you anew to feel more confident and competent in what you are doing so that there's a greater sense of, you know, confirmation and clarity around what you are reading. And as we will continue to do here at Walking the Text, like we want to continue to serve as a guide for you on your journey ahead, that as you go back and check out previous teaching series episodes and all forthcoming teaching series episodes, every single time we're opening up God's Word, we are utilizing you know, the lenses of context. And we may not overtly say, oh, this is coming out of the cultural lens or this is coming out of the literary lens. You will know that because you understand the structure, you understand the framework, you have worked through this series And again, our desire for your journey ahead is that the Bible would come alive to you in ways that hasn't before, that so many new observations will be made. And not, again, just so that we become smarter, but that we become more faithful in following Jesus Christ in our lives. So friends, thanks so much for you know journeying with us through this series, for watching this episode, for listening to this episode, for just being on this road with us at Walking the Text. Uh, we're so grateful for you. And as always, may you walk out the text well in your life.